Thiel there. Let's talk today about the now somewhat infamous experiment done by Dr. Calhoun, known as the Mouse Utopia Experiment. This test basically simulated a perfect world, for mice anyway. Everything that they could possibly need or want was provided for them. And this entire experiment was here to document birth rates and any sort of behavioral changes that individual mice, or indeed the entire population, may go through in such a circumstance. And what has made this particular experiment so famous was that the total population never reached the peak of what it could sustain, and the fact that in the end it also declined until the point of death. And given, of course, that this was a utopia, it was the perfect environment for these animals to live in, that was somewhat an unusual outcome. However, many other studies similar to this, done not only on mice and rats, have also shown a similar outcome. And the final very interesting thing to consider here is just how this pattern of behavior may very well be replicated in humans. So let's have a look at the mouse utopia, shall we? And for this video, I'll be drawing on quite a few sources, but the big two that I'm going to be referencing is a documentary made about this particular experiment, which will give us a lot of visual aids and cues to go on, but also on Calhoun's own write-up, Death Squared the explosive growth and demise of a mouse population. Calhoun begins his write-up with a rather whimsical and some would say quite unusual talk about the horsemen of the apocalypse, and makes particular reference to the writings about the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. I saw a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him, and they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine, and with pestilence, and by wild beasts of the earth. This led Calhoun to consider bodily mortality as it was referenced in the Book of Revelations. And even though the death of the body is described in a very simplistic fashion, it was ultimately not an inaccurate description of ways that a person can die. And Calhoun simply applied all of the various ways that you can kill a living organism and put it into the context of ecological expression. And some of them are fairly obvious. Famine translates to resource shortage and or the potential for natural disasters such as fire, flood, earthquakes, etc. Pestilence remained exactly the same. It was just the spread of disease. And wild beasts, again, very similar. It was a reference to predation. The sword was perhaps the most curious one which he translated to emigration when it came to animal populations. But he does further clarify why this choice was made, noting that animals in the wild rarely die from the sword directly, and that few are the deaths from intraspecific combat. But in this instance, he likened the sword and dying by the sword to a failure to be the victor in intraspecific struggle. For example, losing rights to certain pieces of territory. If an animal loses its its right or is pushed out of its territory, which may have been the most favorable feeding ground available, then they have been forced into a suboptimal habitat, which then increases their exposure to other mortality factors. This is then linked to an excess of population in a certain area, and this concern is why a lot of animals, especially social animals, will remove members of their own in-group when they get to a certain age, usually the young males, who will then be ejected and forced to go and live either on their own, or to ingratiate themselves with another group with whom they will then breed. But of course, not all of them are successful in that endeavor, and some of them die. And from this point of view, the emigration out of the preferred territory is a mortality factor. So what exactly was the Mouse Utopia setup, or Universe 25 as it was codenamed? Well, it's possibly not as interesting as you might think it could be, but certain elements about the setup are very, very important when it comes to analyzing the results, specifically the radial layout of the Utopia. This entire experiment was set up in a 2.5 meter by 2.5 meter square which was one and a half meters tall. So kind of a squashed cuboid. And it was specifically designed so that the mice could not climb on the upper 17 inches of this cube, which would be their new home, which prevents them from emigrating to another environment. 
that's one mortality factor eliminated. Resource availability was distributed completely evenly. Each one of the 25 and a quarter linear segments of wall was identical. They each contained four vertical tunnels which enabled the mice to go up and down as they pleased, and at every eight inch interval above the floor, there was an entrance portal to a nesting box. Each nesting box was large enough to contain 15 mice that could comfortably nest there simultaneously. Calhoun described it as, thus there were four four-unit walk-up one room apartments in each cell. There was a wire mesh food hopper in contact with the right hand tunnel of each set of four tunnels. These mesh hoppers were large enough that 25 mice could feed simultaneously from each one. And on the roofs of these little mouse blocks of flats or apartment complexes were large water bottles. Each one was big enough that two mice could simultaneously drink from each bottle. And on top of this, there was an abundancy of paper strips provided to the mice as nesting materials. It's literally everything a mouse could want in life. All of their base needs are taken care of. Working it out mathematically based on the average times that it takes a mouse to consume a certain amount of food, or drink water or anything like that, it was calculated that food would only become a limiting factor at a population of 9,500 mice. Water would become the limiting factor at 6,144 mice, and given that there were 256 nesting boxes in the 16 cells, it was expected that nesting space would only become a problem if the population exceeded 3,840 mice. So going by the most limiting resource, which is nesting box space, this miniature perfect mouse universe should be able to house just shy of 4,000 mice. However, what is very interesting about this experiment is that the peak population of mice reached 2,200. At that population number, 20% of all of the available nesting sites were not used. And that's going to be a very key point when we look at what happened population-wise and behavior-wise to all of these mice in a little while. Further to all of these other concerns that the mice have, the universe was maintained anywhere between 20 to 30 degrees Celsius, and was varied according to the seasons, and the mice were provided with a nice little bit of air movement from a few fans set up around the place. Because this experiment was indoors, no rain could fall into their sanctuary, so there was no sort of risk associated with that whatsoever. And it should also be noted, because all of these conditions that they're kept in are idealized, that there is no evidence that indicate that any of these conditions enhanced the mortality of the mice. Add to that the fact that the entire population of mice came from the National Institutes of Health breeding colony, which took extreme precautions to ensure that there were no types of disease in any of the mice that were given over to this study. To prevent any problems from diseases, pathogens, contaminants, anything like that, Every four to six weeks, the nesting material and floor material were replaced. And finally, and I think most obviously of all, no predators had any access to the mice in this universe. So that is all external mortality factors removed. The only things that can kill the mice in this universe is old age, other mice, or some manner of suicide contrivance. And so the stage was set. A perfect utopian vision of a world for mice. Now all it needed was to have some mice in it. Day one saw the introduction of the first inhabitants of the mouse utopia. Eight mice. Four male, four female. The Adams and Eves of this new Eden, if you will. Using a population graph, we can track the mouse population throughout the entirety of this study, which, with retrospect, can be broken down into four distinct phases. Phase 1, the first 100 days, has been termed the Strive Period. It was a period of adjustment and exploration, and a few disputes as territories were established. Day 104 marked the transition from Phase A to Phase B, when the first litters were born. Phase B was the phase of the most rapid growth seen in the mouse utopia, 
and has been named the exploit period. The population doubles about every 55 days. Even though resources are plentiful and are available evenly throughout the environment, the birth distribution is not even. In fact, it exhibits a very interesting pattern of bilateral symmetry, a pattern that is not optimal in a radially symmetrical environment. The Northeast brooding groups only produced 13 young in the 252 days, whereas the opposite Southwest brood group produced over 80 times as many. 111. When these numbers are plotted on a graph measuring the number of pups to the number of pups per brood group, a very interesting and distinct pattern of hierarchical ordering is found. Basically, the dominant males bred with more females than the less dominant males. And the population distribution here is really rather interesting. Where the dominant male stakes out his territory and brings on board many females because of his social dominance, more females are likely to go because that's the dominant male. They want to have his babies. And this grouping of females attracts other males, some of whom are allowed to stick around and others of whom get chased off. Obviously, the ones who get chased off are moved further away from that area. So this is a rather distinct pattern of social dominance. And it demonstrates that even if all resources are evenly available everywhere, populations will not spread themselves out evenly. Because in the social game, who is just as much of a resource as what. These mice did not cluster here because of what was available, they clustered there because of who was available. Day 315 marked the beginning of Phase C, known as the Stagnation Phase. The reproductive rate of the universe declined drastically, only doubling about every 145 days and showed several marked changes in male and female behavior. A lot of the younger mice became very withdrawn, and they didn't vie for any sort of territory because all of the territory had already been claimed. They merely clustered together on the floor of the universe, but they would exhibit quite high levels of aggression towards other socially withdrawn mice. This generation notably had a lot more scar tissue and scabs and chewed tails as a result of this constant fighting. During this time among the socially withdrawn males, sexual deviancy began to manifest, with males increasingly mounting other males. The general fertility of females declined and the rate of reabsorption of fetuses increased. General maternal behavior also became less prevalent. And even more interestingly, because the males weren't stepping up to define territories and claim new territory, nursing females began taking on that male behavior themselves, which would also then manifest towards their own young, resulting in shorter than normal nursing periods. There was another pattern of male behavior exhibited towards the end of Phase C and into Phase D. These males were the counterparts to the non-reproducing females. Dubbed the Beautiful Ones, they dedicated all of their time solely to grooming, eating, and sleeping. They ceased engaging in sex or even attempting sexual advances towards females, and they wouldn't fight with the other males. Appearance-wise, they were exemplary specimens of the species. Perfectly groomed fur, clean skin, bright shiny and alert eyes. However, they completely lacked any degree of curiosity or the general inquisitiveness associated with a mentally healthy mouse. Even if these mice were removed from the Mouse Utopia universe and placed in adequate housing alongside an adequate sex partner, they were simply incapable of social interaction and would continue to engage in the behavior that they engaged in when they were in Universe 25. Indeed, this was true of all the mice. But the beautiful ones, while appearing as an excellent specimen, they were in fact mentally and socially retarded. Phase D was the last phase of the mouse utopia experiment, adequately named the die phase. Population increase abruptly ceased on day 560. The last known conception took place at around day 920. Females who did fall pregnant in this phase seemed to be incredibly despondent when it came to taking care of their pups. In some cases, they would attempt to move them, but could be seen simply dropping their pups, and in some cases, they might have only moved half of them seeming to forget that the other half even existed. This may very well 
well be related to the general social retardation of the entire population. Phase D was by far the longest phase, lasting just over a thousand days, and it was a non-stop downward spiral. In the end, the majority of the last remaining half of the population consisted only of non-reproducing females and attractive, uninterested in sex males. On day 1588, the experiment was terminated because of the extinction of the colony. So what can we learn from this experiment, and how applicable is it to humans? Well, the answers vary quite widely. The main difference between humans and mice in this particular instance is that humans are a lot more intelligent. And so, even if put into a similar situation, it is possible that that intelligence would enable at least some people to find some manner of solution to the concept of a population collapse, or indeed to ensure that it never even gets to that state. One of the other really large factors comparing the mouse utopia experiment to humans, humans aren't forced to live only in one small area. There is a lot more space available for people to expand out into if they needed to. The Mouse Utopia experiment would be more akin to forcing a load of people to only ever live in a single block of flats and then never leave it. Given that we have a lot more free space for people to potentially move into, that may potentially prevent this from ever happening to people. However, of course, as populations expand and cover the globe, it is possible that given advances in medical technology and ever-increasing lifespans, we may still find ourselves in something comparable to this situation eventually. And as such, excess space could only be a very long delay to the inevitable. Some have also hypothesized that when applying this model to humans, it is in fact not a test of overpopulation. Although to those people, I would suggest that the mouse utopia never reached the point of overpopulation anyway. But there has been some evidence that when applying overpopulation to humans, it's not necessarily the close quarters in which they live that causes social problems, but the loss of privacy. And as such, even in densely populated areas, as long as people have access to privacy, they will not go down the same path as the mice did in this experiment. It's an interesting hypothesis, and we have evidence both for and against it. So it may very well be that the only way for us to know for sure is to put people into that environment. And even then, it's not a guarantee for the answer. Different population IQs put into the same model could very well yield different results. Indeed, Jonathan Friedman, who was one of the scientists who was also interested in the subject matter of Calhoun's experiments, suggested that in the case of the Mouse Utopia experiment, it wasn't overpopulation which was the problem, but that the real problem was uncontrolled social interaction which further reinforces the point and concern regarding privacy. But even with all of these things considered, there are still several similarities between the experiment and human behavior that can be seen. Females becoming increasingly aggressive and taking over masculine roles, the disappearance of masculine role models, problems regarding social and sexual exclusion, the rise of single parenthood, mostly single motherhood, and the associated stress that that brings to the parent. All in all, the Mouse Utopia experiment is a very interesting thing to consider when looking at human society and the way things are going, particularly in the West today. But owing to a few differences between humans and mice, physiologically, mentally, and socially, one should always be wary drawing too stronger conclusions and take any direct comparisons made with a grain of salt.